want to get through this? Go! Welcome to the Roadhogs Radio Network, brought to you by the Roadhogs.com and Roadhogs Motorcycle Magazine. Want to be part of today's show? All you have to do is pick up your phone and dial 347-539-5667. So let's bring on our host and get this show started. Two six packs of shiner, 99 cent butane lighter, lucky strikes and a fifth of Patron. everybody in with a little bit of blackberry smoke there. Um, hope this finds you well and enjoying their, uh, your Wednesday night. We're glad to have you and we hope to have a good show tonight. We're going to do a little bit something a little bit different and uh, we've got a big group of folks on with us tonight which should make for an interesting show. Um, on a personal note, I'd like to dedicate this show to my dad tonight who has been in the hospital the last few days. He uh, had appendicitis, and he had had some surgeries and some other things done, but he's coming out of it, and uh, I'm glad to hear it. So tonight's show is going to be dedicated to my dad on a personal level. Um, with that, we're going to continue on from last week. We had Steve DeCosa on, who was in the 2014 Motorcycle Cannonball, and he was a competitor and a finisher. And this week, we're going to continue talking about the Cannonball and the event itself and uh, some of the people that are involved. And so tonight I've got uh, four other competitors from the event. I've got uh, Scott Bird from Arkadelphia, Arkansas, who rode a 1931 Harley-Davidson V. David Lloyd from Olive Branch, Mississippi, who rode a 1919 Harley-Davidson J. Jason Sims from Rapid City, South Dakota, who rode a 1934 Harley-Davidson VL. And last but not least, my good friend Ryan Allen from Santa Fe, New Mexico, who rode a 1929-101 Indian Scout. Tonight's show is going to be somewhat of what I like to call uh, Harley versus Indian Wars. Um, all of us out there, we're all good-natured about it. We love all old bikes, doesn't matter what make or model. Uh, so it's all in jest. But on a serious note, I wanted to kind of compare some of the differences between Indian and Harley and, um, you know, kind of go from there. So with that, I've also got a few other guests. I've got Gonzo and Steve with uh, Southern California Motorcycle Association. And they're involved in doing long-distance runs on later model bikes. And we wanted to have them on tonight to compare the event, uh, the Cannonball itself, and kind of see how many we can get involved. So with that, I'm going to stop blabbing and uh, bring in my friend, uh, David, Scott, Jason, Ryan, are you guys there? I'm here. Yep. Yep. Where are you? I'm here. Well, good deal. Welcome to the show, guys, and thank you for coming on. Um, I guess Thank we're going to kind of start off and do a, a roundtable discussion uh, just to make it easy. It's going to be a little bit different having four people on uh, talking about one event. And uh, Gonzo and Steve, I'm not forgetting you guys, I promise. Uh, let's go ahead and start off with introducing yourselves. Uh, we're going to go from Scott to Ryan and from Ryan to David Lloyd and last but not least, Jason Sims. So, Scott, if you guys can tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with motorcycles, and then how you got involved with the Cannonball, and any other interesting tidbits you want to throw in about yourselves on a personal level. All right. Thank you, Buck. Uh, glad to hear your dad's doing okay. I talked to him briefly last night uh, when when he was waiting on everything to happen. He seemed like he was in pretty good spirits, and I'm glad to hear that everything went well for him today. Um, I'm I'm a general dentist in Arkansas. Um, keeps me pretty busy. Um gives me a good living and, and lets me enjoy a, a, a really fun hobby. Uh, meet some interesting characters like, like all the guys on the show tonight. 
Um, I, I got involved with antique motorcycles um, about 10 or 12 years ago uh, with a bike that I knew absolutely nothing about, uh 1929 Harley D, uh, which was the very first year for the Harley 45. And it's kind of a kind of an oddball bike. Um had a, a real good friend of mine, Bill Redensel, uh, up in Waukesha, just outside of Milwaukee, but he helped me immensely with the bike. Um and so he um he got me started on everything. Um and then if you fast forward into the cannonball, um I, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, Buck, you you are responsible for getting me involved with the cannonball directly as a rider, um, and, and you know that very well. Um, I'll say we here at my shop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were here at my shop, and and I had just purchased this 31V, and Buck said, you know, you got the perfect perfect cannonball bike. And I said, well, but I don't have a slot. And so a couple of phone calls later, I had a slot as a rider. And and the rest is history, and, and you got me involved with all these other goofballs. So And I wouldn't make anything in the world for it. So Good deal. I'll, I'll pass the torch and let somebody else introduce themselves. Yeah, let's go to Ryan. But to, to your dad tonight, okay? So good wishes towards him. And um, what I want to say is hello, everybody. I'm right now in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I rode the cannonball, and uh, why and how I got here, you know, I was one of those kids that was told, no, you can't have a motorcycle, but, you know, you build one anyway when you're young, so you kind of grow up with it. Uh, I took a 20-year sabbatical, started watching YouTube videos, and said, you know, I need to get back to doing that. And uh, so we founded the reservation with uh, Kirk McGilvery out here in Santa Fe, and uh, we work on old Indian motorcycles, and uh, Cannonball inspired us. Uh, you certainly did. I watched a lot of videos of you in the first uh, first time you did the Cannonball. And then a lot of these other guys, you know, it's, uh, it's a great place, a good experience. Uh, you'll really learn a lot about yourself, that's for sure, doing the Cannonball. Good deal. Well, Ron, you know, you've got a great story, and I'm, I'm glad you could make it on with us tonight. Uh hope these Harley guys don't... Uh, don't intimidate you. You at the at the reservation there. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, the the bike I rode was. Uh, uh, we had a lot of good times, man. I mean, um, it's uh, it, it's. I think the reality is is that you know we talk about uh, when you build something. Once you build it, you're married to it, so you gotta have some love. And um, yeah. saying that, I built Morticia. Everybody, her name was uh, Morticia, and. Uh, she was an ex wall of death bike. Uh so Morticia had a really hard life. Uh so we took her off the wall so she could ride on the ball. And um that being said, uh she was shortened about two inches. So it was a very uh, uh a cool ride. A very, very fun ride, uh, to be able to get to experience that, you know. Well good deal. Okay, well let's uh let's pass it off to David Lloyd. David, are you there? Yes, sir, I am. And I also want to uh, say good wishes to Mike. I'm glad to hear the good news that the surgery went well. And uh, best to him. We will keep him in our prayers. And uh, I wanted to clarify one thing. You said something in your uh, opening, Buck, that this was Indian versus Harley. And I just wanted to go on record and know that there were three Harleys represented here and only one Indian. I just wanted to be clear that we knew that. (laughs) Oh, oh. (laughs) Dave's looking out for me, man. Yeah. <laughs> hey, like, let's not I, let's not pick on the minority. We've had enough problems yeah. in the So, I, <laughs> really, really, and truly, I enjoyed uh, getting to know Ryan and riding with him. And hey, I was always honored to be around that bike. That bike rolled. And uh, my story is similar to Scott's. Uh, I met Buck. You know that you are uh, solely responsible, you and your dad, of uh, allowing me to enter the uh, team in the early stages when it was first announced. And uh, I had followed both of the other cannonballs very close on the Internet and uh, knew that one day somehow I wanted to be part of it. And uh, so when I got the uh, rider slot of one of the eight in the Carson team, uh, I was just elated. And uh, for a year and a half, I lived and breathed uh, planning for this thing. And uh, it was uh, so much. It's Now that we've had a few months away from it, uh, I think we all have that uh, – 
that feeling like, you know, where'd it go? What happened? It just, you know, you build on so long getting prepared for it, and then, boom, it just comes and goes like a breath of wind. And uh, I still find myself, uh, the thing, the one thing that, uh, and it's neat that you have some guys here that are lo- uh, long-distance late model riders. What's happened to me now is now I'm not fearful of just getting on a motorcycle and disappearing for days at a time. I mean, I, that was not a normal thing that I did, so it was a challenge to ride 17 days straight, you know, 300 miles a day. And uh, now I find myself just itching to jump on my bike and disappear for four or five days and, and just take off, and I don't know where I'll end up. But uh, the Cannonball was an amazing event, and uh, that'll be lifetime of memories. Well, that's great, and, uh, you know, you've got a, a great story, and we'll be talking a little bit more about your, your planning and a little bit of what happened to you after the Cannonball uh, a little bit later on. From from David, let's move on to Jason. Jason, welcome to the show, and I'm glad you could make it. Yes, sir. Uh, great to have me on. Uh, great to be on with the rest of these great group of people. Um, really enjoyed being with you guys there for almost a month of my life. Um, you know, again, well wishes to your dad and Mike, um, one of the best guys that I did meet on the Cannonball. Um, from there, you know, I uh, started motorcycling when I was uh, just a young guy, five years old, I think, is when I first got on my first two wheels. And uh, just kind of, you know, went from there and uh, where we are today. I mean, just never looked back. Um, I'd rather be on two wheels and on four any day of the week. Um, I hear you. Unlike most of these guys, I consider myself bike sexual. I'm not a Harley guy, an Indian guy. I'm a guy that you got two wheels, put me on it, and I'm gone. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it don't matter. I've got anything from, you know, the the early VL that I rode on the Cannonball to mid '60s Hondas to, you know, little '50s to rat rod scooters. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter as long as I'm uh, behind a set of bars. I'm happy. Mm-hmm. Well, that's uh, you know, that's very true. I think for a lot of motorcyclists out there. Yeah, that's the the shared sentiment by us all. So, gentlemen, you all have accomplished an amazing feat here, and I know you all know that inside yourselves, and the the public out there, the motorcycle world knows it. Um, I, I guess the the question that seems to be and that comes up the first is, what was the hardest thing for you in the event, whether it was the exhaustion factor or the motorcycle breaking down? Because at, as I was talking last week to Steve, uh, to our audience. You know, the thing about the Cannonball is that you're riding something that's 70 or 80 years old, or in David's case, even older than that. Um, you're riding it across country, and you're you're beating it to death every day. You're just you're running hard, and it's not meant to do that every day. Even when it was new, it wasn't meant to do that. Um, so there's a lot of exhaustion in the motorcycle, and there's exhaustion in yourself because you have to work on it all day as you're riding it. You have things breaking the side of the road, and you come in at night, and you still have to do preventative maintenance. So... The question I'd like to pose to all of you, um, one after another, is just kind of tell me the hardest thing for you in either exo- in, um, in a physical sense or a motorcycle sense. And let's start with Scott. Oh, yeah, put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I just had a blast riding. I, it, it, it's a, the classic ignorance is bliss thing. Um, I'm, I'm not a gearhead I, as all of y'all know, I, I was one of the least mechanically inclined of, of anybody on the cannonball. Um, and so I relied on a lot of our, our, uh, teammates to, to teach me about the bike. And I, it truly was a learning experience for me as I went. Um, I learned a lot about the bike. I had it for almost a year before, uh, before we left on the cannonball and I put about a thousand miles on it before then, tried to break everything that would possibly break before the cannonball. Um, and did a pretty good job of that. Uh, but still had a lot of components that broke along the way. And, uh, so, uh, for me picking up those skills along the way was a challenge, but, um, you know, the, the two chopper dudes from, from California, they had, uh, had another guy with him, Craig. Um, and <laughs> There, there was an after hours video that he put in there, and or that they did with him. And 
he put it very, very bluntly and, and very much into perspective of, um, you know, when you're on the road that long, there's certain bodily functions that have to take place. <laughs> and um, taking care of some of those functions before you take off on a 300-mile ride is, is very important. And um, staying Good regular morning, on a trip um, like that. Was Scott a, Floyd uh, would say something was wrong. He he would tell you what phase of your infancy you had a problem when you, you know there. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, that was one of the bigger challenges. Um, you know, you you gotta you gotta take care of certain things first, um, and then you know the yeah. bike will take care of you if 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 you just treat her right. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Well, Ryan, what about you? You know, we've got all these Harley guys that they're they're whining and moaning about, you know, bodily functions. What what was worse for you? <laughs> well, you know, it's like um the the funny thing is is like, you know, what do I do in a, a real life is I design and build, you know, Cuisinart houses, right, for people and uh, we have a really fun time doing that. So you know, I always have a lot of challenges. And Lonnie, the founder of the Cannonball, you know, oh, you know, life's full of challenges, and it is. It is um, something that's the hardest thing that you ask, um, I guess, dealing with your failure, because you feel like, you know, certain people, you know, look at it and go, wow, you know, I learned a real valuable lesson here if I'm going to do something crazy like this. Um you know, like one day, you know, I almost got bit by a copperhead and I didn't even know it, you know, when I broke down. And it's like, you know, just don't go laying down by the side of the road because you might get bit by a copperhead. You know? <laughs> That's right. I remember that. Time. Why were you laying you know, on the side of the road anyway, Ryan? Okay. So, you know, I had like, you know, I had like this perfect points ride. Kirk and I were just like running hard and had a really good ride for five solid days. And, so you have this tremendous high where you're like, wow, the time I spent in the garage has really paid off because, you know, it's not like, it's not really, it's not really a competition with like, you know, you think about the other riders. Some people do, but it's, it's really like, Hey, you better, you gotta, you gotta treat your lady right. And you gotta, and so, you know, I, I built that lady and I'm thinking, when you have to deal with your failure or like bad gas. So the day that broke down, it was like I had just filled up with some gas, right? And it was just really bad gas. It was somewhere in Missouri. <laughs> and the carburetor just started popping. And I was like trying to climb a hill and had no power and it's pouring rain. And you're thinking, I never thought I was going to have to put a Ziploc bag over my Magneto. It's not like you like go take an old Indian out and be like, you know what? It's raining. I think I'm going to take a fur ride today. And it's like, no, cannonball, rain, you got to go. And it's like you learn a lot of valuable lessons. Like, you know, you want to ride a bike like the Frontier guys did? You got it a lot easier than they did. But dealing with your failures, I think that's the biggest thing. If you come to the cannonball and think about it, that's like, you know, personal accomplishment, you know, years of preparation, like building, and it's hard. And it's and you have heartbreak. You and I know that. And it's like you want to just enjoy it and then and, and, and have all these great group of people you ride with who share a common, you know, thing. It's like, yeah, I want to ride every day. I want to get every mile, you know. And, that's right. Uh, when you when you have that failure it hurts. Well, you know, that's that's a very interesting point and there are a lot of highs and lows in the cannonball. One of the things that that you find as a spectator and as a participant is that uh, the the vastness across the board of, of people that have high moments and then turn around and have extremely low moments is just it's it's a huge part of the experience. You have guys that are running a perfect score and then they have two flat tires in one day and it blows their perfect score. Um <laughs> And that that brings us on to our next person, David. Uh, folks, what you what you should know about David Lloyd? David is a good friend of mine, and, and a lot of people here on the show we've we've known David for a long time, and he's he is probably the most prepared person I've ever known in my life. And like he said in his introduction, he spent more than a year preparing his 1919 Harley to compete in this event. Um, it was it was built to win, and the way you win the Cannonball is by making every single mile. Having a uh, having a lower class bike, a class one, class two, class three, um, and really studying your competition. And David did 
all that to the T. Uh, we affectionately called him Mr. Spreadsheet on our team, and it was a term, a term of endearment because you know David had a had a spreadsheet for everything have, having to do with the cannibal, including the competition and the other bikes out there. So, David, you know, you prepared for a year for this thing, and you did above and beyond what most people did. Tell me, what was your hardest part of the cannibal? What was the most eye-opening experience for you? Really, really backing up and kind of analyzing, you know, I, 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 I like I said earlier, I just lived and breathed. I'd lay in bed at night and I would just think through scenarios and say, okay, what if this happened? How you do that? And so the planning part, and I, and guys, every one of you that did this knows knows how hard it was and how what it took. But I honestly, after it was all said and done, I skated through it really before I realized fatigue didn't hit me until the last few days. And uh, but one of the one of the things a, a man that helped me tremendously was Dave Kleps. He ran in the 2010 Cannonball. He rode a 1915. He rode almost a perfect. I think he did have a perfect score. He was like sixth or seventh. But he almost kind of took me under his wing and coached me and talked to me. And he was an older fellow that uh, almost treated me like a father figure. And I mean, he walked me through scenarios. And one of the things he said that's going to take most of the Cannonball people. The hardest that's going to be the biggest surprise that's going to hurt the most, and that was your butt. And he he said you're going to be screaming after seven to eight days of sitting in the seat every day if you're not used to that. And so, twelve months before the cannonball, he makes this proposition to me, and he says, "If I were you," he said, "What do you drive every day?" And I said, "I drive a Honda Element." He said, "If I were you, I would tell I would go find me a bottom seat frame, and I would get a motorcycle seat." and build you a bracket and put it in the car, and I would ride on it for a year and condition your butt. Because he said, that's what's going to be the toughest thing. And we posted that on Facebook, and boy, did I get some laughs, and people just couldn't believe it. And I did. For 11 months, I sat in a motorcycle seat in my car. And when I now that it's over, when I talk to people in discussions and things about the cannonball, they're like, how'd you do 4,000 miles? Did, did your butt hurt? And I'm, I just have to tell them it didn't. It, it, I, it never bothered me one bit. And uh, a lot of the things that I planned for, I think, were the same same way. I, and I, by no means, don't, please don't take me as saying I overprepared. But really and truly, I almost feel like I skated through this. And that book talks about that two day, t- the two flat tire day. Uh, I was like Ryan said, day five. I actually made it to day ten with a perfect score. And day 10 was my tremendous day. That was the day we went Loveland's Pass, and I made all three of those passes that day. And on the last leg coming back in to uh, where we're coming into Burlington, I think, uh, about 98 miles, I have a flat. We buck stops and helps me change this tire in about 45 minutes on the side of the road and slaps me on the tail and says, hit it and get on, get on in. And 30 miles later, the back tire goes flat again, and I had to get on the trailer. And it devastated me. I mean, it, it took me a day to uh, get over that. And the, what was so great was the next day being ready to go again, that was the therapy that, that pulled me out of it. But it hurt because it was my own personal goal and uh, to be 98 miles from a perfect score. It would have changed the whole outcome of my game had I not had those flat tires. And uh, Ryan said another thing that was uh, that was amazing about uh, uh, getting to know a motorcycle. I've, I've had a lot of motorcycles in my life. Never have I known one as intimately as I know this bike. And uh, you live on it, live it for that kind of time. And uh, I, I probably will never get rid of this bike now because of the love and the and the journey we took. Sure, I can I can totally appreciate that. And you know, folks, something I'd like to add to what David said. I, I don't know if anybody remembers from last week's show, but uh, Steve DeCosta and I had talked about one very important aspect of being involved with this motorcycle cannibal, and that is that you have to be a little bit insane. And the fact that this man rode on a motorcycle seat in his car for a year, I think that proves <laughs> that. <laughs> no, David, David just, he's like, dude, I'm serious, okay? You know? Wow. I guess my yeah. only other question is, do you still have the motorcycle seat in your car? No, I took it out a week before uh, the cannonball and put it back, put the real seat back in it. My wife was happy, too. <laughs> she wouldn't even drive the car. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> hey, 
<laughs> yeah, let it be said that all our significant others really put up with a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think anybody who's married could ever say that their spouse did not play a huge role huge in, in what we were able to, yeah. to accomplish. My wife puts up with a lot. You don't even know. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I know. I, I know, Ron. Your wife does put up with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, uh, let's go to Jason. Jason, you know, you you have an interesting story because you started out with this VL and I know you wound up finishing it on a 36 Harley Knucklehead. First, tell us how that happened, and you know, tell us about your bike and all that. Then, kind of talk about your experiences. You know, what, what was a hard part for you? I've I've really kind of analyzed it too. You know, I think my hard part was um, the pre-preparation to the Cannonball. Um, I don't think people really realize of how time really flies. You know, we we knew maybe eight, nine months ahead of time, you know, January, February, you know, that we were looking at maybe doing this. And, um, you know, I, I really took for granted that uh, I've got nine months, you know, piece of cake. I'm used to putting bikes together in, in one week and, um, you know, driving as many miles as I want on more of a later model bike or, you know, even into the 60s and 70s bikes that I build, you know. And I really took for granted that um, that time went so, so fast. You know, uh, a lot of people chuckled at me that, you know, it's August 15th and I'm still in a rolling chassis, you know. And, and, And that was just preparing this on my part, you know, I didn't think it was going to be as difficult to, as it was to actually find the parts for one, you know, and then once you do find the parts, it, it's not an exact fit, you know, so then you got to rework it, remanufacture it. Um, you know, you got to build that bike to the last and go. And, um, you know, I, I think my thing was if I were to ever do it again, I would do a lot of stuff a little bit different and uh, not wait till per se the last minute to, uh, to really get going on this thing. Um, uh, as, as far as the bike on the run, you know, and, and that's probably why I ended up riding a different bike uh, through the run. I had a couple of catastrophic failures, um, just some issues that I, you know, just couldn't get past. I mean, the stuff was good. It was just not enough break-in miles, um, not really being intimate with that bike like some of these other riders were. You know, when I, you know, basically started the thing up for the first time four days prior to the Cannonball, you know, you, you don't really have a whole lot of chance to get intimate with that. Know where you should be riding it at. I think I probably just overworked it a little bit. Um yeah. So what wound up happening with your bike that you had to swap? Uh, You know, I uh, ended up having two catastrophic seizures. Um, You know, I've I've got some some oiling issues with with the machine, uh, maybe an air intake leak. Um, It just does not like to run, you know, run hard like that, like like that we put these machines through. Um, and maybe with some more time, it could definitely get dialed in and, and do it again. But, uh, you know, after beating ourselves up for the first 10 days of, of really trying to rebuild this thing every night and put it through its paces and breaking down, you know, uh, luckily I had, you know, some of the best teammates there was. You know, I had teamed up with uh, um, the Olsons, with Carl, Matt, and Brittany. And, um, you know, we had decided ahead of time that, You know, we were going to go for fun. We really wanted to have a good time, make it more of a riding experience. And uh, so we decided to bring, as a team, an extra bike. And um, so after, you know, the 10, 12 days, we just decided, hey, let's quit beating ourselves up. Let's have fun the rest of the ride. And uh, I ended up becoming one of them knuckleheads. You know, one of them knuckleheads. There you go. <laughs> one of them knuckleheads. You know, one of them guys that leaves the very last in the morning. You know, we pass everybody before we get to the first gas station. You know, we sit around and have coffee for an hour there. We pass you again before lunch. 
And uh, <laughs> you know, always one of the first ones in. You know, when we get I mean, crews doing we, 65, 70 miles an hour all day, uh, you I know, think, we can. Well, Buck, if I can interrupt, I was going to say Jason and I talked about this, and it was like it was inevitable. You know, when the knuckles show up, they, they, you know, when you talk about the differences between the machines, it's, you know, it's, it was quite obvious. You know, when you look at the design of the knucklehead, like being, you know, allowed to be on a cannonball, wow. You know, what an amazing feat because they had low production numbers, but here you had a machine that would really perform and put, and could put down every mile, you know, relatively trouble free. That's right. We almost well, felt like you know, they were cheating. You know, because no, it you, was you like, at all. when we come in at night, we jump off and, you know, kick stands down and pop tops up, you know. We're, uh, we're sitting <laughs> having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody else I know, is cheating themselves to death, wrenching. And, you know, when we got to, um, you know, when we got to rest day, it was like, ah, ah, maybe we should do something. I just feel guilty. You know, so we oiled the chain. You know, well, check the tire well, pressure. You guys didn't feel that guilty. <laughs> well, hey, no, no, you, no. You, what happens on the cannonball is, is that, like, the people that are so, like, you'll you'll see them pop around. It's like either they're riding their bike or they don't have to do any maintenance, and they're like they're finished early, so they're going around messing with everybody else. <laughs> I was right. not one of right. those. <laughs> I, I, I no, got a dumb question. If I can jump in for a minute, this is Gonzo. Uh, what? You know, I, I just heard on the knucklehead you're you're doing 65. Well, what speeds were the other bikes doing? Uh, I think most of them are doing what between 47 and 52 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, no, for me. The thing I mean, that, well, Ryan was at about 40, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Not. I wish we had the bleep button, but we don't. But anyway, I'll just say this. <laughs> well, you know. the, the thing about the Cannonball is that a lot of the bikes in it are flatheads, you know, side valves. So, you know, I rode a, a 45 flathead, and I could run about 43, 45 comfortably. And that seemed to be where a lot of the bikes were. And the knuckleheads, you know, for our audience out there, 1936 was a cutoff year for the motorcycle Cannonball this year. Um, and so 36 was the first year that the Harley Davidson knucklehead, the overhead valve knucklehead was introduced. And it was a vast improvement on the side valves and the IOE twins like David Lloyd 1919 um, in performance and a lot of other aspects. So the knuckleheads really were essentially modern bikes because they had recirculating oil systems. You know, the flatheads that Scott, Jason, and Ryan and I rode, uh, and even David Lloyd, they had no recirculating oil. They had to change your no. oil every 150 miles. So the knucklehead, when they came in, it was recirculating oil, and like Jason's saying, he could he could ride all day, come in and pop top the night, and sit around and relax. <laughs> well, hey, if it wasn't for the knuckle, Jason and I wouldn't be friends. How's that? There you go. <laughs> yeah. so Jason goes around and like, "What's going on? What's happening? <laughs> What's hey, and some, and some of us, some of us had to change our transmission fluid a lot uh, more often too. Yeah, every <laughs> night. <laughs> but I every never night. had to worry about my train, my transmission fluid, and changing it because it leaked out so dang fast that it was just in a perpetual <laughs> state of change. Well, it was a greasy pile, but you know, it was like you know, it had some, it had some history. It looked like, yes, I've been ridden. So was it Ryan that had the uh, 21 uh, Indian Scout? Uh, it's a 29 Indian 101 Scout. And uh, the average mile per hour that I would ride would be about 52. Sometimes Morticia would just, I would get, I'd let it, I'd get out of control. And uh, uh, 52 going downhill. No, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so you're. Uh, I, let, let me ask you: Have you ever ridden a 101 Scout or no? I have I'm, not. I'll answer that. No, I have not. All right. So it's a great experience, and the Scout was the reason why all the old slogans. Should we do it here on the radio. It's like it's Harley versus Indian Wars. We got to have some of that, right? So they would yeah, say, you know, that, that brings up right, the hard, point. Right. They would say, and, and I, hey, you guys know that I don't really give a shit. It's like, you know, it's like, hey, it's a Harley or an Indian, but it, they would say, what was it? 
it would say you can't wear out an Indian scout, its brother or its brother the chief. It's the you know, they're built like rocks to take hard knocks. It's the Harleys that give you all the grief. The only reason they came up with that slogan was because this little one oh one scout was a wonderful machine with a helical drive and no primary chain. Hey Brian, what ma- one overall? What's that? What uh, one an overall? Indian, an Indian scout with a helical there drive. There you go. Yes. <laughs> David, who's so, inviting you on? <laughs> no, no, you guys know. You guys know. It's, it's, it, hey, it's all. It doesn't matter what lady you bring to the ball. You have to love her. So that's the that's the lady I brought, and I'm gonna dance with her. You guys know. You got the same deal. Absolutely. Right. Uh, you know, I, I'm well, Matt Ryan. I, I have. Can I can I say something real quick? Go for it. Okay. Um. Uh, there, there's a sticker on the battery box of my bike. I'm looking at it right now, and I can't oh, say yeah. exactly what it says. <laughs> yeah, but it's got do. a picture. You know what it says? Can, can I say that on the radio? It <laughs> um, it's I, probably not a good idea if you say what that. Okay, I'll, I'll paraphrase. <laughs> uh, but it's a picture of Alfred Newman with an air, from Mad Magazine with an arrow through his head. Uh, it says Indian motorcycles with a question mark, and it says I'd rather have a sister in a house of ill repute paraphrase, than a brother on an Indian. Well, so I'm riding down just... the road. Huh? <laughs> okay. I'm I'm riding down the road, and I don't know Ryan at this point, but he rides up beside me, and he starts pointing down at my bike. And, you know, everybody kind of helps each other out that, you know, your kickstand's down or, you know, you, your saddlebag is loose or, you know, something's about to fall off. Whatever. And he just keeps pointing down. I wore a full face helmet. I had a hard time looking down around and everything, so I couldn't tell what he's looking at. So finally, I slow down enough to look, and I realize he's pointing at the sticker. And in the meantime, he passes me and goes on. And so yeah. that's how we met. Um, but then later on down the road, I, I did I, I did catch back up with him because my bike was so much faster than his. Um, <laughs> and we we got to um, well. We we started um, interacting with each other down the road, um, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Scott, you know, it, it, go ahead, go ahead. Scott, whatever happened to your pet copperhead snake? That wasn't my copperhead. That was Ryan that almost got snaked there. Okay, so, so yes, the copperhead, if you really want to know, it, the only reason why we knew there was a copperhead there, and this is the it's God because your bike truth. broke down. No, it, it was like, well, uh, I got a bike. I got, no, I got a bike. I have a bike named Morticia. I'm on the side of the road. I'm in some place in Missouri, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. It's like, what else could happen to me? And, uh, so the the magic bus, I don't call it the bus of shame. I will call it the magic bus shows up. And I'm I'm like, I'm not supposed to be on this thing. And uh, uh, Pat Simmons gets out, and he walks over towards me, and he steps right next to this hole. I was laying down, and, and out comes this copperhead. And, and Pat was like, what is that? I said, that's a copperhead, you know, kind of back up, man. And he was like, uh, I, you were laying right there. And I was like, yep, I sure was. He's got an hour. <laughs> and, oh, so let me tell you this. So while I'm sitting there in the rain, and I've got to look, I'm, I'm depressed. You, you don't even know. It's almost like, did I shoot myself? And it's like, no, I'm sitting there. Here comes Scott popping up the hill. Pop, 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 pop. And he just kind of looks at me. And his face shields down because it's raining. He's like, screw that guy. I'm going on. <laughs> well, I'd like to bring like, our two uh, our two other guests, Gonzo and Steve, uh, because Gonzo and Steve are involved in the Southern California Motorcycle Association, and I hope I said that right, guys. Uh, but what you guys specialize in, um, you know, I was talking to my studio manager, Chi, today, and he was telling me a little bit about your organization. And you guys deal specifically in long-distance rides on later model bikes. So what I'd like to do is have Gonzo and Steve come in and kind of talk to you, you, you guys, David, Scott, Jason, and Ryan, and kind of you know compare and contrast and ask some questions, just uh, as as a modern bike rider would be a bike rider. See, 
you know, what what the big deal is about the cannibal, because we've talked a lot about it in, in the last two shows, and I feel like there's still a lot of people out there that don't don't really get it. So I'd like to see if uh, maybe Gonzo and Steve could bring this into into perspective for everybody. Go ahead, Gonzo. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. And, and again, I'm glad to hear uh, Mike's doing well. Hear that uh, it, it sounds like you uh, retrieved uh, your bikes that were stolen back out in uh, Tacoma. So I'm, I'm glad, yeah, I was glad and, to and, hear and, too. Yeah, and we'll um, actually get into more of that later on in the show. We'll talk about that with David Boyd. Well, good, good. Um, the um, I, I'm, I, I tell you, just listening to you guys, uh, I, I'm a new bike rider. I, I just started uh, almost four years ago, um, and uh, and it's just been a hoot. I've been having a great time. And as I'm listening to you describe this event, and 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 I'm I, I get into I get these things. I I just you know they they appeal to me, and I'm thinking like. Okay, where do I find an old bike? <laughs> I don't... Uh, you know, this this sound, it sounds like a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Uh, well, the, well, I guess can I jump in and Scott and whoever? It, this community, it's really kind of like it's about people, so you have to really kind of seek it out. It's almost like this taboo because. When I grew up doing this, there wasn't a lot of people doing it back then, and I'm not very old either. But it's it's you have to become a people person because it's the older generations that have a gift to hand down to the younger generation. And the problem is is that the cost really is not effective for a lot of people, so that's a difficult thing. Uh huh. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine, but uh, you, you know, let, let, let me bring uh, Steve on. Steve, Steve uh, it will will warm your hearts because he's both an Indian and a Harley owner. Um, so, uh, Steve, why, why don't you jump in here? Yeah, well, the uh, the Indian I hold is a 2014, um, and so it's not uh, what anything to do with vintage motorcycling. Um, and, but I'm a long distance rider, but not on a vintage bike. Uh, but I got to tell you how guilty I feel after listening to your stories, um, because um, you know Gonzo and I both ride you know tens of thousands of miles on these things around the country, and um, you know we're listening to XM radio, and uh, at least I'm got a heated seat and heated grips, and I'm in a full face helmet, um, you know, Dirk, and uh, you have heated so much grip. different. What's that? You have a heated grips and a heated seat. Yeah, on the uh, the Goldwing that I take around the country. Yeah, um, oh, but I'm never going to recirculate normal too. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I'm so, never going to complain again about anything <laughs> with regard to long distance after hearing your stories. Uh, it's, it's well, more of a you, you know, game, the, one of the things I I like, and that's why I ask about the speed because I, I've had buddies of mine pull up next to me and. And look at me like, dude, you know, why are you going so slow? I'm doing 70. I like 70. That's a nice speed. And I'm listening to you guys saying 50. I'm thinking, you know, that sounds like even more fun. <laughs> <laughs> that it is. It's that a, it is. It's a totally different experience. It's a high unlike any other. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it well, sounds terrific. And while you guys were talking, I was on your, I was on the uh, Cannonball website looking at the bikes and that uh, – 1929 Indian Scout is absolutely gorgeous. Thank you uh, very much. Ryan, I appreciate that. That's Ryan's bike, I believe. And then I looked at the 1919, um, and uh, it also is just gorgeous. I was trying to follow you guys on the website looking at the bikes, but it uh, sounds like a terrific run. Uh, well, you know, Cannonball is a lot of fun, and we have, we've got some great stories. That everybody here has stories. Um, you know, Ryan on the side of the road, almost getting bit by a snake. David having a perfect score and blowing two tires. Uh, Scott, you know, oh, Scott. I mean, Jason. <laughs> Just go ahead and say it. Well, Scott has many issues, but that's on a personal <laughs> level, too. Yeah. Well, I, I can relate to uh, motorcycle uh, tire repairs because I do have a tendency to grab it and have a magnet for nails, screws, and bolts. Um, I've had four flat tires in four years, which probably isn't a lot for you guys. Um, but on a late model motorcycle, it's unusual. I think there was a day we had four flat tires in our group. Yeah, yeah, 
I hooked you up, Jason. I hooked you up. You got the one, <laughs> know, one of the... that actually worked. So do you guys, are these all tube tire, tube tires, I assume, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. So, so yeah. you're taking these ti- you're taking these off and just re- patching tires. <laughs> uh, you, you patching the tires. Well, we tubes. tubes. <laughs> What's that? You carry a, a spare, spare tube. tube. You carry a spare tube. So you just take the tire off and replace the tube like a bicycle. Yeah. yeah but but you could, <laughs> patch, you could patch the I... tube and still use it if you could find where the hole is, right? Yeah, well, I'm sure just, you could. Less effort, don't you think? Yeah, Can so, I you know, question? when you take a shower at night or, you know, get in the tub, that's where you start looking for that hole. <laughs> <laughs> Easy, everybody, slow down. <laughs> so Robert, I got me a spare tire. <laughs> now, that was Gonzo, by the way, for the record. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's kind of move on to talk about the end of the cannonball. Um, for those of you who are, are aware of the events, the cannonball was 16 days, 17 days on the road, one rest day, and we wound up in Tacoma, Washington, on the 22nd of September. And on the 23rd of September, uh, Team Carson Classic Motors had a theft. We lost a truck and a trailer. It had about uh, you know several hundred thousand dollars worth of motorcycle parts and tools and equipment, as well as uh, four cannonball bikes. And we actually instituted a, a pretty successful viral. Uh, campaign to get the word out about the stolen property. And the next day, next next couple of days, we got the truck and the trailer back, as well as four stolen bikes. Um, David Lloyd was one of the individuals who had things stolen from him. So, David, I'd like to kind of turn it over to you. Um, you know, you're still missing a lot of things. And this is an opportunity, I think, to kind of share the word again and get the public's eye on it of what's out yeah. there. Tell me a little bit about your story about about what was stolen and how it all worked out for you. You know, that morning when I looked out from the 22nd floor and looked out and the truck and trailer was not where it was the night before, I called John and said, hey, I got my my bag. I'm ready to put it in the truck. We were heading home that morning. I said, where'd you move the truck so I can put my bag in it? And he's like, I didn't move the truck. And it just went all downhill from there. But uh, the, uh, the truck... The trailer and the four motorcycles full packed with, you know, with all our gear and everything was completely stolen. And as time evolved, we found the truck, and then we found a good Samaritan who uh, called us and saw the trailer behind his business with the four motorcycles. So John and I brought the motorcycles back home, and uh, we, we both still lost almost a complete motorcycle disassembled for spare parts. I mean, I had a complete spare motor, transmission, generator, uh, carburetor, and these pieces I never used. I mean, my bike never mechanically broke to a point where I had to use any of these parts. So they were all had been test run and were ready. And and any of you know that you know you get a, a 1919 motor completely built, ready to run. I, you know, if I could find that thing again, I wouldn't take ten grand for it. You know, if there's somebody wanted to buy it, it was just a, a, a sweet motor. And, uh, and, you know, I have a lot of people that still ask me of any news on the stuff. And, you know, I've had to kind of move on. And I'll tell you, I, I'm not going to allow that dark black eye part of the event learn what really happened to me. Uh, I, still, I still look at the great event we had. Uh, the I got the bike back. I'm thankful for that. But, you know, I remember thinking out there when everything was gone and I was trying to take it in and understand that uh, – you know, I I may have rode this bike 4,000 miles and threw it in the sea out there in Tacoma, and I was going to come home empty-handed. And so I was trying to cope with that and think about that. So getting the bike back was a great blessing. And my insurance has stepped in and uh, helped me with the riding gear. All, everything, I you know, I had all my leathers, my r- boots and helmets and goggles and gloves. You had everything thinking of what, you know, what you would anticipate to need to ride. And so every bit of that was taken and um, my homeowner's insurance did help me out with that. But we we still are missing a ton of stuff that is uh, hopefully will show up someday. You know, and in in even talking now, you know, you just don't know what kind of audience gets to hear this, but uh, a 1919 motor, when it comes out on the market, there's people who are going to raise eyes and say, hey, this uh, this is not a everyday motor that you just see floating around for sale. The people that are in these kinds of motorcycles and hobbies. It's a pretty tight knit. 
as Buck alluded to, when uh, the word spread, I mean, we had motorcycle people from all over the world putting this on everything they had from late model to uh, antique to German to it, it just was amazing. Uh, can I share the last little story, just a funny story of how it ended uh, coming home after we got the bike? Is that okay, Buck? Absolutely. Coming home after we got to Dallas with the bike, I rented a truck, an open uh, Ford pickup, and I loaded my 19 in the back of the truck and my gear, and so I'm heading home. I've been gone a month, so I'm flying home from Dallas to uh, Olive Branch, Mississippi, and I'm uh, making pretty good time. And as I'm driving, I'm noticing that truckers are kind of pulling stupid stunts is what I thought. I really never alluded to anything other than you're going up an incline and the guy in the left lane or in the right lane will pull over and block you in the right, in the uh, left lane and just slow your way down. And it takes, you know, three miles to get around him. And then I would get around him. And then two miles up the street, it would happen again. And I'm just thinking, these truckers, man, come on, get with it. And so I'm flying home, and uh, I get all the way to Brinkley, Arkansas, and I pull over in a shell station and gas the truck up, and I'm making good time. And so I'm starting to kind of be a little more aggressive driver. I'm not letting these trucks mess me up. So I'm kind of bit bobbing and weaving is what I was in my mind I was thinking. Well, the next thing I know, I got blue lights behind me. And uh, I look up, and, the, and I honestly thought, uh, this is honest to God, when I looked in the rearview mirror and saw the police, I'm thinking in my mind, that he's got me for bobbing and weaving. I've been driving kind of crazy. And so he pulls me over and he says, yeah, we've got reports you've been driving reckless. And I said, officer, I am not driving reckless. I said, these trucks have been uh, zigzagging around, but I'm not, I promise you, I'm not driving reckless. And he says, sit in the car for a minute. So he goes back to the car and he leaves me. Well, And here again, I'm still not thinking anything odd other than he's pulled me over. And just to prove that, in my mind, I'm watching him in the rearview mirror, and when he comes back to get me to, uh, up to the car, he doesn't have a ticket book. So I'm honestly like, cool, he's going to let me go. He don't even have a ticket book. And so he says, step back here to the car, let's talk. And then he starts reading my rights and tells me that I have the right to remain silent, and he is fixing to handcuff me. And I'm like, officer, for bobbing and weaving? He said, no, sir, for stolen motorcycle. And it just <laughs> shot, and then it hit me. And I said, no, no, the motorcycle was stolen, but it's been recovered. And he said, oh, he said, sir, he goes, these truckers have been following you for two hours. They know this is the one of the stolen motorcycles, and they've been following and keeping up with you. They knew that they, they knew that you were at Brinkley at the Shell Station, and they've been bobbing and blocking you until the state troopers could get here to get you. <laughs> so what a story. Well, he, uh, he, then I start to throw out paperwork to prove the bike is who it is, and so he begins to believe me. And he goes, these truckers were on you. He said, they got close enough, saw the tag number, knew this was one of the stolen bikes that was uh, stolen in Tacoma, Washington. And uh, and so the policeman turns out to be a biker, and he starts getting friendly now because he's like, God, he goes, I can't wait to tell my uh, officer about and friends about this. This is amazing. And uh, he goes, hey, he goes, right up the street at Brinkley, we're having a biker beer fest. you mind coming up and bringing this bike up there? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, officer, I've been gone a month. I've been gone a month. I'm trying to get home. And he goes, I understand. All right, well, have a good trip. <laughs> well, David, Scott, Buck, I got you guys know that that's a real important message about the cannonball. It's about integrity and the opposite of that is deceit so it was really a saddening moment for us all oh Absolutely. gosh I, and it still is for me but i've got to look past it and know that uh there was many many good even though it, if i if i lose that motor and that transmission forever i, I lost it but it just i'm not going to let it wreck what it was for me that's right now david uh go ahead and share with the audience we, we've got a few places out there that still have complete listings of the stolen items that are out there. Um, David, if, if somebody wanted to contact you or try and find out what all was missing, where would they be able to go? Do you have a link or do you have? Uh, do you want to give out an email address? How do you want to do that? There, uh, I do. I have uh, uh, my. I'm on Facebook as David Lloyd. It's easy to find. And, and if you go to the Cannonball page or just in Facebook, I'm there. You can reach me there. There, I'm also in a uh, national registry that I found out that is a uh, police registry that actually keeps up with uh, legal 
uh, pawn shops that actually turn their serial numbers in and they run that database. They, I constantly have uh, that database watches Craigslist and eBay, but uh, uh, I, I'm going to say Facebook's a great way. I, my email address is David Lloyd 44 at Comcast.net, and uh, you know, just always uh, there. It's listed on Craigslist as a uh, as a advertisement page we keep that live i think buck didn't we still have a guy that did a page called stolen cannonball bikes.com that's right we've got a website uh if anybody <clears throat> wants to go out there and look at the complete listing of items that are still missing uh go to www.stolencannonballbikes.com and that will bring up all the information uh it'll bring up a tip line where you can submit tips of things that you've seen or heard and uh hopefully we can help you know, the individuals get their stolen gear back. Now, folks, it's kind of getting close to our uh, time tonight, but uh, I wanted to thank everybody for coming on, all, all you guys. We really appreciated you. And uh, I wanted to, to share with everybody, once again, the Cannonball website, if you're interested in finding out more information about the race, is to go to www.motorcyclecannonball.com. Or if you're on Facebook, you can go uh, check out facebook.com slash motorcycle cannonball. It'll bring up the official cannonball group. And uh, there's there's a lot of great stories and information that will be coming out in the future magazines over the next few months. Uh, we had great people on the run, some well-known people. We had Pat Simmons of the Doobie Brothers. Uh, Michael Lichter, the, the famous photographer, was our official photographer for the event. And if you're interested in looking at some of his photography, uh, go to... Uh, just Google Michael Lichter or go to lichterphoto.com and it'll pull up his entire website. Uh, so once again, folks, thank you for tuning in tonight. I want to thank everybody on the show. Uh, we really had hey, a great Buck. time. I'm glad you were able to spend some time with us. Buck, can I mention one thing before we go? Absolutely. Not. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, the the cannonball is all about the people involved with it, um, and it it I, I feel like it it's a, a brotherhood of sorts. Um, and we had uh, one of the mechanics uh, that was with the uh, the chopper guys, Robert Hernandez, uh, was in a, a bad motorcycle accident just what a week ago, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has he, he's got a site, or somebody else has started a site on the GoFundMe. Um, and if, if they'll just look under Robert Hernandez, because he's going to have some some pretty impressive medical bills. Um, if anybody wants to donate to that site, they can. And Robert was a he, he was a, a, a wonderful guy um, and helped that team out a lot. And I, know, I know he was very well liked by all of the, the Cannonball people there. And he's making some good progress, but, but he's still going to have some pretty hefty medical bills. Right. And uh, thanks, Scott, for sharing that. And, and once again, guys, I really appreciate you coming on. I know you all are busy. We're all busy. But, um, you know, it's it's a great opportunity for our audience to hear about one of the hardest motorcycle events in the world. And, and Gonzo and Steve, I hope you guys enjoyed your time with us. Um, I hope it didn't scare you away from doing something crazy with old bikes. Um, hmm. So, folks, that's going to do it for us this week on Classic Chrome. Uh, if you tune in next week, we've got two good friends of mine, uh, Cindy Hill and Alex McLean, who are armor racers. And uh, we're going to have a great time talking about racing and getting old bikes on the track. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com slash Plastic Chrome Radio. That's the official social media home for, for the show, and uh, you know it's where we'll be posting all of our pre-recorded and podcast shows. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you have a great night, and that'll do it for us here. Be safe. Thanks, Buck. Thanks, Thanks Buck. Thanks. Bye, guys. Pleasure meeting Bye-bye. you all.